it's called Imagining the Kingdom. And uh, we also work together on, uh, on, on one called Teaching and Christian Practices, and there's a follow-up to that coming out next year called Teaching and Christian Imagination, uh, which I just delivered to, to Urban's. Um, and uh, so it, both of these books on practices sort of yielded a next book that was about imagination. And that's what I want to focus on this morning, is, is imagination, Christian imagination, teacherly imagination. Um, partly out of the hunch that what drives a lot of our practices is not actually our carefully wrought philosophical concepts. It's our basic pictures of the world, it's the scripts we carry around in our head, it's what we think a teacher is, it's what we think a classroom is, in largely inarticulate, um, non-formalistic ways. Uh, I want to try to think about it in a a way that's not entirely linear, so I'm gonna, we're going to play for a little while. You might not see where we're going right away, but we'll get somewhere eventually, I hope. Um, and I guess part of the, the, the conviction that led to this is that very often what happens in the modern world in Christian education is that we're inserting um, Christian beliefs and pieces of Christian literal, uh, uh, liturgy into a largely secularized imagination uh, in terms of how we imagine what school is and what classrooms are and, 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 and how the whole thing works. And, and the effect then is sometimes a little bit like sort of, you know, watching Star Trek and suddenly seeing Little Red Riding Hood walk onto the bridge of the Starship Enterprise. Um, you get this, this kind of grinding of narratives when, uh, when, when you try to think about what it might mean for something Christian to happen in a science class or, or something like that. So, so I want to play a little with this notion of, um, of imagination. You're going to need a partner. So you might want to identify who that is if you chose a space to sit that gave you personal space between you and the next person. Um, so here's your first task. Um, I'd like you to imagine that you're this person. Um, it's going to be easier for some of you than others. Uh, I'd like to imagine that you're an ancient Near Eastern ruler, um, a despot, a conqueror of countries, uh, that uh, you have a considerable empire. Um, just to help some of you, there was one female pharaoh who wore a fake beard, so um, <laughs> that, that helps. Um, and um, one evening, you, you, you're, you're just a bit of a loose end, so you head down to the pub, and <laughs> you're, you're standing propping up the end of the bar, and suddenly the, the, the door to the pub bursts open, and three or four other guys in pretty expensive clothes and with impressive beards um, come, come bursting into the pub and end up at the bar and, and it turns out that it's, it's three or four other ancient Near Eastern rulers on a package tour and um, you get into an argument at the end of the bar, you get into a boasting competition about who's the greatest ancient Near Eastern ruler, who's the biggest, baddest um, emperor in the region and, uh, and you know over a couple of beers this starts to go on for a little while. So here's the conversation I'd like you to have with the person next to you. If you were in that argument, what claims would you make in order to boast that you were the best ancient Near Eastern ruler that the ancient Near East had ever seen? What kinds of things would you boast about being better at, right? Probably not Nintendo, but what? Okay, so talk about that for a moment. <laughs> Okay, now, um, <clears throat> let me just take a show of hands. Um, how, many of you, how many of you mentioned the size of your army, how many soldiers, chariots, horses, 
uh, military things. Good. Yeah, you would probably boast about that if you're a nation theorist and ruler. How many of you boasted about building projects, right? Palaces, pyramids, um, city walls, etc. Yeah, that would be on the list too. How many boasted about how many women you control, right? Harem wives, concubines. That would be on your list, right? Um, how about the amount of wealth that you have? Gold, silver, precious artifacts from other countries. Yeah. Um, wise men in your in your palace, right? Libraries, scrolls, that kind of thing. Yeah, you're educators, you can think of that. Um, okay, Chris, for next year, find a speaker who can talk to them and sort of say, like, books before armies. Right? Uh, uh, how many of you um, thought about um, entertainers at your court? Uh, that was a long shot, but might have been in there. Uh, how about hunting? Prowess in the hunt, ability to kill lions. Anybody get that? No? We're starting to scrape the barrel. Um, <laughs> slaves. Person power. Yeah? Kind of. Okay. Uh, how many people mentioned gardening? Yeah. Well done. Yeah. <coughs> gardening would have been pretty high on your list if you were an ancient Near Eastern ruler. Um, and it's not one that occurs to us today as being part of our imagination of what makes someone regal and powerful. You know, imagine you're making a you know a biopic about Ashurbanipal II, and you you cast Sylvester Stallone in the uh, in the title role, um, and uh, you, you're thinking about how to start off the movie, and you need a scene that's just going to set character and get us into the notion that we're watching a, a movie about a powerful dictator, and so you you show Sly kneeling down in the garden with his dibbler getting his seedlings in a straight row. You probably wouldn't do that. Um, so this is not really a big part of our imagination, but and yet fortunately we actually have a transcript of the pub conversation um, at the end of the bar. It was recorded in the Bible. Um, and it goes like this, Ecclesiastes chapter 2. This is Solomon boasting about being the biggest, baddest ancient Near Eastern ruler that we've seen. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. <clears throat> I acquired men and women singers and a harem as well, the delights of the heart of man. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. Um, I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me, says Solomon at the end of the bar. Um, so this is, this is a boast speech, right? I was, I'm the best king we've ever had. I'm working my way back up, right? We've got, we've got the harem, we've got the, the wives and concubines, right? We've got the, the men and women singers, the, the conquests, the kings and provinces, um, implying the army, uh, the silver and gold. We've got herds and flocks, we've got the slaves. But the first third of the passage is about how good he was at gardening. Um, which again, might not have been where we would have started. So why? Turn to the person next to you and tell them this for 30 seconds. Why would gardening be a big deal if you're a king in the ancient Near East? Why would that make you rich and powerful if you could do gardening? Because it wouldn't right now. Talk about that for a second. <laughs> Okay, now, uh, anybody got a quick theory? Yeah? Right, we probably could, and that may be part of it, but the part of the point of the gardening here is that it's non-utilitarian, right? It's not just for the food. Um, any other factors going on in here? Yeah? Well, God ruled over all the elements, but yet you can guard him, and you're ruling over them in a sense. Right, yeah. Demonstrate mastery over 
nature in a way because it wasn't a lot of where they lived weren't natural habitats for beautiful gardens. Right, mastery over nature. What particular scarce resource does it demonstrate mastery over? Water. Water, water right? Um, if you're thinking, you've got the reservoirs to water gloves of flourishing trees. Got to remember when you read these passages, now I can't guarantee that this took place at the pub, that's a midrash. Um, but, um, but I do know that it took place in a water scarce environment um, where it doesn't rain as much as it does in Michigan. And uh, where you can't rely, and where there isn't a plumbing system to sort of take over when it's not raining. Uh, so it's expensive to get water from point A to point B. If you want to take water from the river, make it go uphill, um, take it to the place where your palace has to be, put in a garden there, and keep it green and flourishing, that implies you've got a lot of slaves carrying buckets. And that makes you powerful and wealthy, right? And if you're doing that not to keep us from starving, but just because you like to have a garden outside your palace, that makes you wealthy. Um, so this is this is partly a status thing. So you know the water piece of this is pretty important. Um, of course, um, one of the wonders of the ancient world was the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Um, this is an actual photograph of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, and not at all a screen capture from a video game. Um, but um, again, if you um, if you're in a water scarce environment and you're doing architecture that's based on baked bricks, then getting water to the top of a structure and getting it to stay there is actually a pretty big engineering feat. Uh, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon are pretty wonderful, right? And if you want to do that just because you've got a wife who pines for the mountains, um, then that also makes you pretty powerful and wealthy. Um, oh, I've got the power source. Sorry about that. Um, now, once you start looking for this, you see it all over. So if you read Genesis 13, right, Lot looked around and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered like the garden of the Lord. God's a great king who waters stuff, um, and if something's well watered, it makes well watered, it makes it like God's garden, right, because God's a great king who can water things. Um, Psalm 104, read the whole of it for homework, I'm not going to quote the whole thing now, it's quite long, but it's a big chunk of it is is just a lengthy reveling in, the, in God's ability to water trees, which if most of us wrote worship songs, wouldn't be the first thing that would occur to us to, you know, to, to sort of put at the top of the list of God's great qualities, right? That he's, he, he can keep the trees from drying up. Um, he makes springs pour water into the ravines. It flows between the mountains. They give water to all the beasts of the field. He waters the mountains from his upper chambers. The land is satisfied by the fruit of his work. The trees of the Lord are well watered. It goes on and on. Right? Of course, we read that today and we think, oh, nice nature poetry. Um, I'm standing near something that's making me click, but uh, it's good. <laughs> um, is it the recording cell phone? Is there, is there a cell phone? Any theories? I wonder if it's this. Well, I think, no. I think we're touching it though. Oh, it's not. <laughs> okay. I'm making glitch music without trying. So, um, should be recording it for later. Um, in context, again, there's this, there's this boast about God's generosity of provision and you know, ability to provide water where there's little water. Um, Psalm 1. Verse 3, you know Psalm 1, you know, blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, so on, right? He's like a tree planted by the streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Those who know way more Hebrew than I do um, say that there's, there's two interesting translation choices here. First, that um, streams is probably not streams, it's probably channels. Um, being planted by a stream wouldn't do you a lot of good in an environment where the streams dry up nine months a year, right? Um, and, and, the, and the Hebrew word here is the word that's used for dug channels. And these, these palace gardens and temple gardens that were planted had channels in a cross shape, right, four channels through the middle of them that were filled up from big jars every morning by the, the slave labor to keep the palace garden flourishing, right? So these streams are streams that somebody's putting water into to keep the thing flourishing. And planted, um, William Brown says this should probably be transplanted. One of the practices of ancient Near Eastern kings, just like British Victorians, um, was to go conquer other countries and dig up samples of the local flora 
um, and cart them back to their palace and plant them in the palace garden and boast that they could make them flourish there better than in the country that they took them from. So the imagery here in Psalm 1-3 may be, from what I gather from the Hebrew scholars, that, that God has essentially gone to a foreign country, conquered the foreign country, uprooted you from there, planted you in his palace garden, and can now make you flourish permanently there better than in the natural conditions in the country that he took you from. Um, so this, again, this gardening imagery is very resonant in terms of, um, in terms of conquest, power, generosity of position. This is a picture from an Assyrian um, war relief. You can see the king over on the right-hand side sitting on the raised throne. You've got the cupbearer slash poison taster um, sitting facing him in front. You've got the people with the palm leaves um, sort of in a way keeping him cool. Um, and you've got trees all around him, right? The garden is right in the midst of the palace. He's sitting in the midst of a grove in the midst of his palace um, because that's a pretty cool thing to have if you're a king. If you look at this tree here over on the left, if you follow the, the trunk right up to the top and look just to the right of it, there's something hanging in the branches of the tree. Any idea what that might be? Beehive? Looks a bit that way, doesn't it? It's the head of a recently conquered king. Um, so your palace garden is also the victory garden. It's where you hang up your conquests, right? It's uh, because, again, you know, these transplanted trees are also symbols of conquest. They're also symbols of uh, the size of your empire. Um, so I'm starting to fill out a picture here about you know, gardens in these texts don't mean what gardens mean in your imagination. Because you're modern city dwellers. For you, garden means a little bit of natural respite in amid the concrete. Right? Uh, it's not what gardens mean here. Gardens here mean generosity, power, um, authority. Uh, they have this regal quality to them. This is the account of the heavens and the earth. This is the second creation story, because there are, of course, two, not just one. Um, in, uh, in Genesis. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet shrug up, shrug, sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. Remember the first creation story starts with everything being formless and empty, right? and then God starts ordering things sovereignly. The second creation story starts with a place where nobody's watering the garden yet. right? Um, there's no water source yet, so stuff isn't growing. So it likewise needs a king to step in and actually take authority over this. And if you keep reading, it says, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. And remember the rest of this, you remember the, the four rivers, right, with the four different names? There's a whole bit in the middle of Genesis 2 that modern readers kind of skip over to get to the interesting bits. Um, because knowing where the rivers were is not really part of what you're looking for in Genesis 1 and 2. Um, but again, part of the way this works in this context is, it was dry, there was no water there, and then God turns it into a garden. It brings these rivers, these streams. And the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. Um, so God comes and plants a garden, um, and he's able to water it. That's part of the creation story. Now, interesting things start happening historically with this, um, because, of course, a little bit later we get the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden, to, walk it, to work it and take care of it. Genesis 2.15. Now, Garden of Eden, let's pause over that for a second. Um, pretty much all of your modern translations treat Eden as a proper noun, right? as, as a name. And, and that's fine, right? I mean, you, you, but it's also a Hebrew word that means something. And so if you read older Latin translations, it's not translated as a proper noun. It's translated um, as a regular noun. And so the, uh, the Latin version of this is the Paradiso Voluptatis. Right, the, uh, it, it's a voluptuous paradise. Right? It's a garden of delight. It's a garden of pleasure. It's a pleasure garden. That's what Eden is. Um, it's this beautiful place that God waters just because it's cool. Right? Just because it's, in both senses maybe, right? but um, you know, just because it's kind of beautiful. Um, and so the Lord God took the man and put him in a pleasure garden to work it and take care of it. Um, Remember, this is an aside here, but remember Genesis 1 start, sort of culminates in human beings being made in the image of God, which you can read Richard Middleton on the image of God, the liberating image is the best book I've read on the image of God um, things. Um, the image of God is language which in the ancient Near East is reserved for kings. Kings get to be the image of God. In Genesis 1, human beings get to be the image of God, male and female, all of them. In Genesis 2, God goes plants a garden, which is a thing kings do, and then human beings get to be gardeners. So there's a sort of interesting pattern going on in there as well. Um, now, Ambrose, 
uh, had a figurative reading of Genesis here because the debate over how to read Genesis didn't start in the 20th century. And uh, he had this whole allegorical reading where he says, by paradise is meant the soul, right? And the fruits on the trees are virtues and the, you know, the birds are temptations and, and, and so on. There's a whole sort of allegorical reading of, of Genesis, which is about the formation of the soul, where the garden is the soul that, that is being tended. Um, Augustine, of course, went for a bit more of a literal reading in his um, uh, you know, literal, trans literal reading of Genesis. Uh, De Gebesi ad literam, and um, Augustine translates it this way because he couldn't read Hebrew. Um, he translates it, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate him and guard him. Now look what happened there through Augustine working with, uh, with Latin and Greek here. Um, we've gone from to work it and take care of it to, to cultivate him and guard him. Right? So through that translation history in the early church, the garden becomes the person who is being cultivated by God, in other words, we become the garden, right? You're this thing of beauty that God created just for fun, um, because, and, and, and then can generously provision, right, can water and, and so on. That's that imagery going on in there. And so in the early church already, gardens become learning images, right, because you're something that gets cultivated. You're something that gets cared for, attended, and that needs to grow. And so gardens become an image, and gardening becomes an image for the formation of the soul, for human beings being educated already in the early church. When we get to the prophets, and of course, you know, had me three hours, we'd need to go through a bunch of wisdom literature here as well, but uh, it's interesting to switch to the prophets here. You start to see some different things going on. Um, remember in Ecclesiastes, we, we saw, you know, gardens as just images of power and wealth and dominion. Um, in Genesis and the Psalms, we started to see gardens as these images of generosity and refreshment and abundance and beauty as well. In the prophets, you start getting another note coming in. Um, let's look at Joel. Like dawn spreading across the mountains, a large and mighty army comes, such as never was of old, nor ever will be in ages to come. Before them, fire devours. Behind them, flame blazes. Before them, the land is like the Garden of Eden. Behind them, a desolate wilderness. In the prophets, fairly consistently, the Garden of Eden becomes a metaphor for a flourishing community that is able to live at peace. Um, before the foreign army comes and burns everything down, it's like a garden of delight. You get up in the morning, you go to work, nobody kills you, um, right? your house is still there when you come home, there's food on the table, uh, your children grow up. Right? It's like a garden of delight. After the army comes, it's like a desolate wilderness. Start noticing this pair. Right? Garden of delight, desolate wilderness. It's an inversion of creation. Creation, we went from the desolate space where there was nobody there to water it yet, and we created a garden of delight. Here we're going from the garden of delight back to a desolate wilderness where nobody can live because everything's burned down and nothing's growing there. Um, in uh, Ezekiel, right, on the far side, after the armies come and burnt everything down and God starts restoring it again, um, on the day I cleanse you from all your sins, I will resettle your towns and the ruins will be rebuilt. The desolate land will be cultivated instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass through it. They will say, this land that was laid waste has become like the Garden of Eden. The cities that were lying in ruins, desolate and destroyed, are now fortified and inhabited. And of course, you know, a lot of Hebrew poetry works on parallelisms. Um, watch the parallels here, right? Like the Garden of Eden goes with fortified and inhabited, laid waste goes with lying in ruins, desolate and destroyed. Now, that's important because in the Old Testament, garden imagery is not romantic fact and nature imagery. Right? The Garden of Eden is fortified and inhabited. It has walls and buildings and city gates and, and marketplaces and, and so on. Right? It's not, oh, let's get away from the dreary business of the modern world and if only we could live in the forest again. Right? That, that's not at all what's going on in this imagery. Right? It's not romantic images of little plants blossoming in the sunshine. Um, the Garden of Eden is when the kingdom's at peace, right? The Garden of Eden is when people are able to live together and they're able to flourish and there's justice and there's, um, there's shalom, there's well-being. Um, and that's just very clear in the way this imagery is used in the prophets. Um, so it's like the Garden of Eden when you can live well together. Isaiah plays with this a few times. Remember in Isaiah 5, the parable of the unfruitful vineyard? Uh, where God goes plants a vineyard on the hillside and he clears away all the stones, and he takes care of it, builds a hedge around it, and a watchtower, and 
And he goes away and he comes back a while later looking for grapes, so he doesn't find any. And so this is what he says. He says, I'll take away its hedge and it'll be destroyed. I'll break down its wall and it will be trampled. I'll make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. Again, we'll take the garden, we'll turn it back into a wilderness because it wasn't fruitful. What does that mean? Interpretation. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. Pause there for a second. So if you don't buy Augustine's questionable translation decision um, about Adam being the one who is cultivated in, in, in Genesis, um, take it from Isaiah instead. Right? In Isaiah, the people of God become the garden of delight. Right? The garden of Eden is the people of Israel. Um, and um, there's loose wire somewhere, I think. But, um, and so uh, the men of Judah are the garden of delight. That's what you're supposed to be. I mean, take this away from one book. You're supposed to be a garden of delight. Okay? Not a wilderness. What does it mean to be a garden of delight? Well, he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed. He looked for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. Well, if there are cries of distress, if there is anyone in your school community who is crying out, this is hurt hurting me, this is not fair, I'm at the margins, it's not a garden of delight. Um, if there's justice, it's a garden of delight in Isaiah. Um, I tried an exercise with my church group once where I, I gave them the first part of this passage and, and then I just said, list ten sins, any ten sins, just take a piece of paper and write down ten things that are sinful. And then we compared lists and our lists were pretty close to the Ten Commandments. We've got murder and adultery and theft and, and so on. So then we looked at how Isaiah goes on and again, you know, homework, go read the rest of Isaiah 5. Uh, the very first thing on his list, it's sort of interesting where this goes next. The next verse is, Woe to you who add house to house and join field to field until no space is left and you live alone in the land. Um, whereas the first example is about land policy, <laughs> which wasn't on any of our lists. Right? The, the notion that certain people are buying up more and more land until there's no place for the poor to subsistence farm. Um, so again, there's a, there's a clear set of concerns resonating through this that you see again a bit later in Isaiah. Now, Here's a nice passage. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. 30 seconds. Turn to the person next to you and tell them just the associations you have with that passage, the first things it makes you think of. Go for it. <clears throat> Okay, now, one of the things that strikes me about this passage, and this sort of you know, confession time, I can think of phases in my Christian life when I would have read this passage exactly like this. In other words, I would have pulled out this verse. Um, it's a great inspirational poster verse. Right? It's, it's one of those to put on the wall and on the desktop calendar. It's comforting. Um, you know, God's going to care for me. He's going to look after me in all circumstances. He's going to make my teaching go well today. Um, and, and so on, right? And, and, you know, maybe that's not totally wrong, but if you actually read it in context, which is usually a good idea, uh, you find that the passage goes like this. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, note it starts with if. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, and if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in the sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You'll be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. You start to see a pattern here, right? Like in Ezekiel, right? The garden is the fortified and inhabited peace. It's when you build up the walls and people can live in peace and there's justice in the land and people thrive together. Um, it's not like a garden if anybody's crying out in distress. It's not like a garden if the hungry are hungry. Um, if anybody feels oppressed, right? There's, uh, that's sort of the duality that's going on in this imagery here in Isaiah repeatedly. So gardens are about wealth and power and abundance and generosity and beauty and justice. Of course, Jesus came along and said, I'm the true vine and my father's the gardener. 
And it's interesting to speculate that he might have known the Old Testament. <laughs> he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Now, I've most often heard this passage exegeted in a way that applies only to my personal prayer life. You, you might want to think about that in context of the passages we've been looking at out of the Old Testament. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. This is remarkably similar to Isaiah 5, where a vineyard gets planted and God comes looking for fruit. Um, and if he doesn't find fruit, then it gets taken down, right? And, and we've just seen Isaiah's concerns around there. Was Jesus aware of what Isaiah was talking about when he said this? And is this maybe about a little more than whether I pray every morning? Um, okay, I said we'd take an indirect path, uh, but let's take a left turn now. This is a picture from the Hortus Delicarium, um, 12th century, Herod, Herod of Landsberg. Um, wanted to write an encyclopedia for her nuns about everything we knew. Called it the Garden of Delights. Uh, this, again, picking up from the early church, this notion of gardens become an image for learning. If you write a book in the Middle Ages for learning, one of the things you might call it is the Garden of Delights. Um, this starts to become, through several centuries, an image that starts to transfer into schooling. Um, easy question, who painted this? Rembrandt. Rembrandt. Hard question, who is it? No? The painting's called An Old Man, but I think it was about three or four years ago, an art historian um, finally arrived at a conclusion that seems to have been accepted about who was the subject of the painting. Um, we think it's John Amos Comenius. Um, how many people know John Amos Comenius? Yeah, that's really sad. Um, Comenius, 17th century, 1592 to 16, uh, 1670. Um, Moravian, uh, he will be Czech now. Uh, if you want to look at just in terms of influence and um, impact and systemic thought, the three most important thinkers in the history of Western education are probably Plato, Dewey, and Comenius. Um, how many people have heard of Plato? How many people have heard of Dewey? How many people have heard of Comenius? Yeah, uh, which is kind of weird, right? But uh, especially as he was the only Christian one of those three. Um, he was a bishop. Uh, he was a church reformer. He actually had a finger in everything. And if I had time, I'll tell you his biography. It's pretty colorful. He lived through the Thirty Years' War. He lost his family twice in battles and plagues. Um, his house burned down with everything he owned at the age of 63, so he had to sat, sit down and start rewriting all of his manuscripts. He still managed to reform the school systems of several countries, write 150 books, uh, was asked to be the president of Harvard, um, translated the Bible, uh, tried to hold peace conferences between the different Protestant groups to try to get the Reformation more unified. I mean, he was just an interesting guy. He was all over the place. Um, one of the things he did was to write this book, The Great Didactic, setting forth the whole art of teaching all things to all men, or a certain inducement to found such schools in the parishes, towns, and villages of every Christian kingdom, that the entire youth of both sexes, none being accepted, shall quickly, pleasantly, and thoroughly become learned in the sciences, <laughs> pure in morals, trained to piety, and in this manner instructed in all things necessary for the present and for the future life, in which, with respect to everything that is suggested, its fundamental principles are set forth in the, uh, from the essential nature of the matter, its truth is proved by examples from the several mechanical arts, its order is clearly set forth in years, months, days, and hours, and finally, an easy and sure method is shown by which it can be pleasantly brought into existence. People who title books have no stamina these days. <laughs> it's actually sometimes hard doing research on Comenius because when you send in interlibrary loan orders, they don't give you enough characters in the, in the, in the field to put in the title of his manuscript. Um, this was a pretty influential book. I mean, this, this, this book is why you have grade levels in school, for instance. Um, it's uh, and a bunch of other things. I mean, this has a, ma a major impact on Western education. Um, and of course, the title gives you a pretty good idea of what it's trying to do. Now, imagine that you're, next thing to imagine, imagine you're sitting down to write a book which you don't know this yet, but this probably is your ambition if you're Comenius, because he, he knew that he was trying to change the world. You're trying to write the book that will completely transform the way education is done in the Western world, right? Because schools just suck and you want them to be different. Um, turn to the person next to you, 30 seconds, 
What's the first thing you would go to on the first page? How would you open? What would be your first thought? Talk about that for a moment. Okay, 1650s. Um, here's the beginning. God, having created man out of dust, placed him in a paradise of desire. Where's the his Bible open right now? Genesis 2, right? Uh, placed him in a paradise of desire which he had planted in the east, not only that man might tend it and care for it, Genesis 2.15, but also that he might be a garden of delight for his God. Where is he now? Yeah, maybe post-Augustinian Genesis 2, maybe Isaiah, right? Isaiah 5 with the men of Judah are the garden of delight. Um, but also that he might be a garden of delight for his God. In paradise, each tree was delightful to look at and more pleasant to enjoy than those which grew throughout the earth. Paradise contained the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Man had the intellect to distinguish and the will to choose between the good and the bad. In paradise was the tree of life. In man was the tree of immortality itself. That is to say, the wisdom of God which had planted its eternal roots in man. The wisdom literature has a lot of tree imagery in it, which we skipped. And so each man is in truth a garden of delights for his God. The church too is often in holy writ, likened to a paradise, to a garden, to a vineyard of God, Isaiah 5, John 15. Uh, but alas for our misfortune, we have at the same time lost the paradise of bodily delight in which we were, Genesis, and that of spiritual delight which we were ourselves, Augustine, Isaiah. We've been cast out into the deserts of the earth and have ourselves become wild and horrible wildernesses. Here's the problem, says Comenius. We were called to be gardens of delight. Our schools should be gardens of delight. Our students should be gardens of delight. But we're not. We're wildernesses, desolate, uncultivated. He translated the Bible. He was pretty familiar with all these passages. And part of what's going on here is he's, he's got an imagination in which all these biblical images, images are swimming around, right? Um, and uh, when he starts writing about schools, immediately he starts writing about gardens. And that continues. He says, we need new schools in imitation of the school of paradise where God revealed the whole choir of his creatures for man to behold. Says, Garden of Delight, where God just showed us stuff. God just put things there that were beautiful, that were, that were amazing to look at, that were juicy, that were, right? School should be like that. Is school like that? Any more than twice a year? It would argue that the early man was unspoiled. Sorry, say again. You, you could argue that Adam was unspoiled. Right. Again, we're not gardens of delight, we're wildernesses. Right, um, but Comenius says, right, we, this means things have got to change. Right, we've, we've got to we've got to work for the redemption of schools, and that means doesn't mean it's going to become a garden of delight overnight. You're in a fallen fallen world, right? But it does mean that God's desire for this is it becomes more like a garden of delight, less like a wilderness. So he starts off thinking about just sort of beauty. He wanted all schools to have a literal garden in them, and for there to be time scheduled in the day for especially young children to spend time quietly in the garden learning how to be at peace with nature. Right? This was part of one of his prescriptions. Um, he, he, uh, he believed that, that you should form students in hard work, but he also said you shouldn't overburden them because they will not be prompt to answer the call of justice if they're exhausted and tired all the time. <laughs> we need to think about that. He wrote a textbook in the, uh, the mid-17th century called The Orbis Sensualium Pictus, The World of Sensory Things in Pictures. It was used for 200 years. None of your textbooks are going to last that long. It was the first textbook to have pictures. He commissioned 150 woodcuts. Um, it included exciting things like tornadoes and battles at sea um, and so on. Um, it begins with the attributes of God in the first chapter. It works through all the different parts of creation, all the human callings. Um, sort of different jobs. There's a, there's a chapter on children's toys, uh, biology, the different parts of the body, comparative religion. There are chapters on Judaism, Mahometanism, um, paganism, um, and um, uh, into ethics. There's a whole section, there's a chapter on each of the virtues, and it finishes with a chapter on the Day of Judgment. Uh, and uh, this was used in Europe at least for 200 years. It was last used in the late 1800s as a school textbook. 
Uh, it starts with learning the alphabet by imitating animal noises. It's kind of fun, especially in comparison with most other 17th century textbooks. <laughs> Uh, Skent should be a garden of delight, right? He wanted stuff that would delight children, uh, but that would also introduce them to this, this vision of all God's creatures laid out, right? I mean, everything, not just the utilitarian things, not just the useful bits, not just the data, right? But, but the whole big panoply. Um, he wanted that to be the framing narrative. In one place in the Great Didactic, he says, the purpose of life is that we may serve God, his creatures, and ourselves, and that we may enjoy the pleasure to be derived from God, from his creatures, and from ourselves. Digest that for a moment. That's what you're here for. To serve God, his creatures, and ourselves, and to enjoy the pleasure to be derived from God, from his creatures, and from ourselves. Is a 17th century bishop allowed to say that, I wonder? Um, the purpose of God, the purpose of life is service and pleasure, right? God, creatures, and selves. Let's let him unpack that just a little bit. I'm going to because of your science theme, I'm going to focus in on the middle one. Uh, but let's look at the first and uh, the first and third for a moment. Um, it took me a while to figure out where he got this from because he doesn't always put Bible references in parentheses. But he's actually riffing on Proverbs 8 here. I wisdom dwell together with prudence. I possess knowledge and discretion. I was there when he set the heavens in place, when he marked out the horizon on the face of the deep. Then I was constantly at his side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence, pleasuring God, rejoicing in his whole world, pleasuring creatures, and delighting in humankind, pleasure in ourselves. Right? So Comenius is really just exegeting Proverbs 8 here. He's saying, if wisdom, and if that wisdom which Christian commentators have taken to be Christ himself, present at the creation, right? You know, true wisdom, right? God's wisdom. What wisdom does is rejoices in God, takes pleasure in God, takes pleasure in the whole of creation, and takes pleasure in human beings. So whenever you look out of your window and you rejoice at the color of the trees, you're doing something wise. Whenever you enjoy the company of your friends, you're doing something wise. Um, it's like what Jamie was saying yesterday about, you know, the spirit of God is not just the sort of miracles and the religious bits, right? It's, 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 this is what wisdom does. If you want your education to seek wisdom, does your education help students to find pleasure in God, to find pleasure in creation, and to find pleasure in other people? Or does it help them compete with other people, make strategic use of creation, and refer to God on weekends? Piety, he says, is all about that after we've thoroughly grasped the conceptions of faith and of religion, our hearts should learn to seek God everywhere, and that when we found him, we should follow him. And when we've attained him, we should enjoy him. One of the refreshing things about Comenius is that when he talks about faith, he can't talk about faith for very long without talking about joy. Um, duty is not his, his um, overriding metaphor. Right? It's, uh, he has to talk about delight whenever he starts talking about piety. Pleasure in self, which is the one that sounds a little worrying if you're a post-Puritan Christian. Um, that very sweet delight which arises when a man who is given over to virtue rejoices in his own honest disposition since he sees himself prompt to all things which the order of justice requires. I find that a really interesting sentence. Um, I, I like the phrasing, this sort of, um, you, you're given over to virtue, right? You're pursuing virtue, and you see yourself doing something that fits the order of justice. I like his choice of verb there. It makes me think of moments when, um, as a father, I suddenly realized that I just managed to do something that genuinely blessed my children, right? It's usually not deeply planned. It, it's, you know, something I said, something I brought home, something I, you know, just something, and, and just joy breaks out, right? And your kids are just blessed, and it's this marvelous moment. And, and, and you think, wow, you know, I, I just did something right. You know, I just did something that was, that was only good, right? And I get that sense from this, like there are these moments when you catch yourself lining up with the order of justice, right? You catch yourself lining up with the healing of the world, with the way things ought to be. And he says that there's a very sweet delight in that, right? Um, that, that's better than winning level 127 on a video game, right? It's, it's sort of, so this is the kind of delight in self that he says we should be fostering and teaching towards. Um, is working towards, how do you work towards experiencing moments when you line up with the order of justice and then celebrating that? 
In another of his books, The Pamp Idea, he says in the first chapter that his goal in writing, he says, the expressed wish is for full power of development into full humanity, not of one particular person, but of every single individual, young and old, rich and poor, noble and ignoble, men and women, in a word, every being born on earth with the ultimate aim of providing education to the entire human race, regardless of age, class, sex, and nationality. He's writing this in 1650, right? Um, he's about 300 years early. Uh, how could, why does he write this? Well, because education's got to be a garden of delight. And if it's working better for boys than for girls, then it's not a garden of delight. And if it's working better for rich people than for poor people, then it's not a garden of delight. This is part of his how his imagination works, right? When he thinks about school. Um, and so he's saying some pretty radical things. He, he got let go from a couple of school systems. Um, And interestingly, in the Pamp idea, he continues right after this passage, he says, I had this consideration in mind when I put the symbol of the art of the tree pruner in the frontispiece, showing gardeners. Again, if you actually trace through his writings, when he talks about justice, you find him talking about gardens. Um, and these things are sort of swimming around together in his imagination. It's just the way he imagines the world. But let's think about the middle one, delight in creation, because you've got this nature focus in your conference here. It's one of the things in the Pamp idea, he says, about nature. He says, finally, material things also are affected by the education of all men to a rational life, so that they too benefit from wise handling by wise men. Um, by the way, this is a 19th century translation of a 17th century text, hence the men language. Uh, thus, as it's better for a garden to be under a good gardener, it's better for any material things to be under owners who use them in their own right, provided that they know how to use them legitimately. There's a memorable saying of Solomon, a wise man regardeth the life of his beast, but the wicked man is cruel. What cruelty is inflicted, inflicted everywhere on all things that are put to improper uses through the wickedness or the ignorance of man? The apostle hinted at this when he declared that all creatures are subject to vanity and that they pray and long and hope for deliverance from such iniquitous bondage. It's desirable in any case that this hope and longing of creatures should be fulfilled and that everything everywhere should advance correctly and that all creatures should have cause to join us in praising God. He says, one of the ways you can tell if your school is a Christian school is by looking at the way the world is treated by people who went through that school in the community around the school. Right? Do, do animals get treated well? Um, does creation get treated well right? by people who went through your school? So he's got the beginnings of a pretty good ecological theology going on here in the 17th century, right? Which he's also a little ahead of the curve on. Um, and, but again, it's because he's meditating on gardens of delight all the time, right? So it's, it's a wilderness. It's got to turn back into a garden of delight. Um, it's got to be a place where God can rejoice, where creatures can rejoice, where human beings can rejoice. Um, this is kind of the vision. He wrote plays for his students to perform um, to try to make the classroom more enjoyable. He said there should be a petting zoo in school. Um, things that we kind of take for granted now, like you know, there being guinea pigs in elementary schools and so on. I mean, you know, before Comenius' day, people were pretty much memorizing passages of Latin and getting beaten for mistakes. Um, this is uh, it's interesting. One of the places where he says what he's aiming for here is he says, the entire world will be a garden of delight for God, for people, and for things. That's his mission statement. <laughs> I've obviously never heard that your mission statement should be achievable, but uh, that was um, it's one of the things, this is what he says he's trying to do, right? Um, this is where he spent his entire lifetime crisscrossing Europe, sort of urging people to reform their schools. But the entire world will be a garden of delight for God, for people, and for things. Um, and that's just a little, I've done two things so far, taken on a little wander through scripture, just trying to build up this little sense of what, what a garden's doing in the Bible, right? And, and I've got an implicit agenda there, which is, how do we read scripture, right? Is it a source of truths to win arguments? Are we able to read it in a way that sort of open up this imaginative world that scripture gives us, where we start thinking about gardens, and we go beauty and justice and, and, and dryness and abundance and, and, and so on, to actually start letting some of these biblical images become alive enough in our imagination that they start to shape the way we see the world. And then we went to Comenius, who spent a lot of time with the Bible, he translated it, and this is deep in his imagination. And Comenius turns around and looks at schools in a way that has all of these biblical images floating around at the back of his mind, 
And when he looks at schools, he goes, they've got to be gardens of delight. And that enables him, I'm not claiming it's the only thing that enabled him, but it's one of the things that enables him to think about schools in a way that was pretty different from a lot of the people he was working with in his century. Um, and he starts thinking about how schools could be more like a garden of delight. And it becomes this, this light motif for him, right? This, this way of imagining what classrooms should be like. And he starts trying things out. He starts writing new textbooks and making woodcuts and planting gardens and writing little skits and, and so on. Just starts trying to design learning that makes it more like a garden of delight. What would this mean for science education? I'm not a science educator, but here's a few thoughts. Uh, Comenius does talk about science education, and some of what he says is very 17th century and should stay there. Um, but and there's some interesting stuff along the way. And of course, you know, like reading any old text, right? The Comenius, you've got to, you've got to, you know, decide what to carry forward. Um, but it's a few things that I think he would have said about science education. Uh, so just sort of synthesizing from what we've looked at. First, he would have he said very clearly in many, many places there is no part of creation that should not be studied and understood. Comenius would never have adopted the kind of rhetoric that yields a certain domain to the scientists and another domain to theology um, and says Christians ought to be wary of getting too smart and sort of, you know, stick to just sort of, you know, not know too much. He says, no, it got, God laid out the whole creation for you to study. And he's also quite strong on disciplined attentiveness being one of the things that leads to delight. So we have to learn a kind of disciplined attentiveness towards creation to see what's really there. Um, so he's, he's very strong on, no, you should study everything fearlessly, right? Um, you should go learn the discipline of attending to what's there. Secondly, he would say that divorcing empirical knowledge from virtue and piety is destructive. Learning about the world has to be inter integrally connected with learning how to treat the world well and learning how to take joy in its beauty. If he saw a classroom where he would say, you're just learning scientific facts about creation, but there is no joy and wonder, and there's no focus on what this means for how we treat the world in terms of our ethical formation. In other words, there is science education without virtue formation. He wouldn't have called that science education. Um, of course, this makes him a little medieval. Um, I also think it might make him right. Um, but um, he would want the science teacher to be thinking about what kinds of virtues are for being formed by the way in which students interact with material in the classroom. Uh, and thirdly, that would mean that aesthetics, ethics, and affect, or emotions, matter in the science classroom. Every act of teaching and learning is fostering the garden of delight, which is about knowledge, justice, and joy, in Comenius, among other things, or the wilderness. That means that if you want to have a Christian conversation about science education, that conversation is not going to be exhausted by deciding who is right about controversial science issues. It's also going to be a conversation about the aesthetics of your science classroom. How much of beauty is there in your science classroom? What picture do you choose to have on the screen before the students walk into the classroom as they come in? Is there music playing? What would it take to organize a science classroom so that students experience something of the wonder of the world, not just how to manipulate it effectively? in order to report back. How would you integrate that into science education and still keep it science education? Because you've got to think about the aesthetics of the science classroom. You've got to think about the ethics of the science classroom. Do students learn in the science curriculum about how science funding works and who gets money and who doesn't and why we research some things more than others? Like diseases that affect Western white people more than diseases that affect African people, for instance. Um, is that part of science education? Learning how science works? Um, what about a PhD friend of mine who was a research physicist, figured out halfway through his PhD that his results had weapons applications and he was a pacifist. He spent half a year redesigning his research work so that it would fall outside the Ministry of Defense specifications. Those are the kind of decisions people have to make who do scientific research. Um, again, other people might make other decisions, but that's part of how science works. What are the virtues involved when you publish your work early because there's $10 billion at stake before you're really sure about it? Um, is that part of science education? Or as Jamie said yesterday, is science a set of findings that we need students to get straight and in the right order um, and so on? So what are the, 
what kinds of ethical formation are going on within the practices of science. Um, and affect, feelings, um, because it's related to joy and delight and so on. What's, what's the, just what's the affective climate of your science classroom? Um, uh, I may have said this last time, but you know, I've been in faculty senate here, and, and often I would see um, course proposals going through faculty senate from the science division that would say things like, um, students will experience awe and wonder at the complexity of God's creation. And I often put my hand up and say, no, they won't. Why would they? I mean, I've sat through lots of science classes where I didn't experience any awe and wonder at the complexity of God's creation. I experienced boredom, frustration, sense of competitiveness, confusion, a strong desire to be elsewhere, um, depression. Um, I mean, those are pretty much my memories of science class. That's why I dropped all my sciences when I was 14 and took languages instead. Um, so, again, what's the effective tone? That's relevant to a Christian conversation about science education, if you're thinking in terms of gardens of delight. So notice how, if you're thinking with Comenius here, the, the faith of science conversation becomes a lot bigger than how many years ago did human beings appear, right? Or, or those kinds of, not, you know, not that, I mean, I'm sure, you know, we're going to continue to have fruitful conversations about those things, right? But that's a little, that's one little part of, of what it might mean to think about Christian science education. Let me end with a story and a thought. Um, a friend of mine told me this story. So I was 14 at the time. It was a Thursday afternoon biology lesson. Our teacher gathered us around the front desk and produced a human brain in a large glass container. He proceeded to point out the various regions of the brain and to explain the functions they were responsible for. His words went over my head. I just sat there wondering what this person used to think about and what had happened to all those thoughts now his or her brain was pickled. 35 years later, I can still see that brain and the faces of the pupils looking at it. I can even visualize the slightly green color it had turned. I can't remember what else we did in biology that year. <laughs> so students sitting in a science class, and from what I can tell from the story, the teacher's lesson plan is pretty much about learning the words for the functions of the brain. I don't know if this teacher has thought ahead about what questions this might be giving students, what might be going on in their heads, what, how they might be feeling about this, where this fits into a bigger narrative, this is what that student remembered out of their science curriculum when they were 14, and the person who told me this story was, was a lot older than that when he told me the story. A final thought. We talk about kindergarten without knowing a lot about where it came from. Well, the word kindergarten, which is German, which means children's garden, comes from this guy, Friedrich Froebel. Um, who sort of coined the phrase, but Froebel read Comenius and he got this whole notion of schools as gardens from uh, Comenius's writings. And of course, Comenius was bouncing off medieval people in the Hortus Delicarium, but also he was bouncing off of uh, St. Augustine um, in the early church and Isaiah and, Ezek and uh, Ecclesiastes and Ezekiel and Genesis and so on. So whenever you say kindergarten, you're evoking a history It's all about spiritual formation and delight and generosity and abundance and provision and authority and justice and peace and suffering and oppression. Be annoying to people the next time you hear somebody say kindergarten. Um, it's my sort of final mandate here. Do you know what you're saying there? Thank you for listening.